Well, we're just going to get into it. You ready? I mean, we're just going to just go for it. Um, you know, I'm going to, we're going to be in the book of Exodus today, uh, chapter 32. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and flip there. Anyone just have like a hard copy Bible? No phone, no tablet. Come on. Got some hard copy by, listen, I have one too, just not here. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to be here, but we're going to be in the book of Exodus uh, 32. And I just want to pray before we uh, just get started and just pray that the Lord would, would speak to us and that we would, uh, we would honor the Holy Spirit and we would open up our hearts. And so can we pray? And then we're, we're just going to dive right into it. So dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the, the, the 58 baptisms that, were, that, that happened this morning. God, we are thankful for that. Well, Lord, we praise you for what you're doing in this house. God, we praise you for the way that you're moving in this region and, Lord, in this town. And, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you. Holy Spirit, we honor you this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would, you would speak to us. Lord, we open up our hearts. We soften our hearts for a word from you. So, God, you speak to us this morning. We need a word from you. So Holy Spirit, speak to us. We love you. We honor you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, hey, we're going to pick it up in chapter 32, verse 1. But just to kind of paint a picture of where we're kind of picking this up at is um, the Israelites have just kind of come through. They, they were just enslaved by uh, Egypt. And so the Lord has delivered them from Egypt. And now they're coming to this, uh, this, this mountain, and Mount Sinai. And they're at this mountain. And basically what has happened is, is Moses has been up in the mountain. And he's been up there for 40 days. And he's, I mean, 40 days. I wonder if he took food. I don't know. He was just up there for 40 days, which is a long time, and he's just listening to the Lord. The Lord's giving him instructions on the tent and, and some other stuff, and, he, and this is where we pick up the story. Basically, the whole nation of Israel is at the base of this mountain, and this is where we pick it up. In verse 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, uh, make us gods who shall go before us. I was saying this to the, the first service. I, I might just start saying that to start a sentence. I should just say up. Who does that? Up, make, make us gods. I might just say up, let's go get food. Up, let's go take a nap. My wife would love that. Um, for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So they were scared. They don't know what's happening to Moses. He's been up there for 40 days. He might have died. He, who knows? He might have been taken up to heaven. They don't really know. Um, but they're, they're questioning what's happening to Moses. Verse 2 says this. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are, our, these, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So we see this thing kind of happen, which is kind of crazy. And then basically what happens is God speaks. We're going to skip a little bit, but you can read this chapter when you go home if you want. Um, but basically, God uh, says to, to, to Moses, like, hey, the people uh, at, the, at the base of this mountain, uh, they're kind of wiling out. <laughs> they're kind of like, they're building all these gods. He's ready to destroy them. He's ready to destroy that nation. He's ready. He, he, it, they, they've, they've broken this covenant that they just made chapters before. And he's, he's, he's very angry. And Moses is pleading with the Lord. And he's saying, hey, please, like, do, do you not remember, you know, what are, what are the Egyptians going to say after you've already bring us out? Are our, our, our are they going to say, you brought us out just to kill us? You know, so he's, he's interceding for the nation of Israel. And finally, the Lord relents. And, and Moses, so Moses takes the Ten Commandments, and he goes down to the mountain. And this is where we pick it up in verse 25. And when Moses saw the people had broken loose, uh, for Aaron had let them break loose, uh, Moses stood at the, at the gate of the camp. All right, so Moses comes down from the mountain. He sees all this crazy uh, pagan, you know, worshiping, idol worship. He comes down. He stands at the gate of the camp, and he says, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side of each of you, and go to and fro from the gate, uh, gate to gate, throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbors. And so what I want to kind of focus in on is, I kind of just want to talk about truth. 
I want to talk about standing on your position. You know, if I had to title this message, it would be taking up your position. And that position that we're taking up is a position of truth. I love this depiction of Moses having an encounter with God, listening to the Lord, and then he comes down from the mountain and he takes stand at the gate and he takes stand on what, he, what, what, what was true and he said, who is on God's side? Who's with me? And I just feel like in our culture today, and it's so hard to know what's true. What is the truth? What do I believe? How do we get swayed so much in our country? How did we get so swayed in, in the way that we think and approach stuff? And in, in, in the world today, I just think we need to know what truth is. How do we pursue truth? How do, how do we stand on truth day by day? But not only that, how do we call people to truth? Right? Moses, he was saying, who's with me? Who's on God's side? Who, who knows the truth? Who wants to be on the truth? And so today I want to talk about taking up this position of truth. You know, it's just, it's just so, I feel like the Israelites in this story kind of lost sight of this truth and they're looking for it and, and trying to find it and they're, they're trying to find it in anything that they could. And, you know, and it's just, in this time, it's just truth isn't, isn't somewhere to the left or it isn't to the right, you know. So many people are saying, hey, my source is true. You know, r believe, believe what I'm saying. And then there's others that are saying, hey, no, 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 this source is true. And it's like, how am I supposed, you know, the, it's, the, the truth isn't to the left or to the right. It's literally vertical. There is a kingdom truth. There's a kingdom that we hold on to and that we place on. And that's where we are rooted in the truth. And so there's this thing that's this position of truth that we need to stand on. And the Israelites kind of lost this thing. So understanding the truth is so important because it shapes our whole worldview. It shapes even, even more importantly, it shapes how we view God. So it's pretty important, right, to know how do we seek the truth? How do we find the truth? What is the truth? We need, we, our worldview depends on it, and, and how we view God depends on it. So taking up your truth is realizing that truth isn't over here, over there. It's vertical. Truth is alive. Truth is a person. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, if you want to know what truth is, he's like, it's me. I am truth. <laughs> if you're looking for truth, you found it. It's me. Jesus is the truth. He's always going to be the truth. He's always been the truth. Since Genesis to Revelation, he's always the truth. It's always been Jesus. Come on. And so there's, it's important to believe that truth is literally this person. We as believers have an obligation to not only know the truth, but we have to stand on it. But we must call people to it. People are walking around in our culture today with scales on their eyes. They're literally lost sheep. They're these people who need hope, who have no answers, who are living in this, in this state of questioning everything. We as believers have the truth. Do you realize that today? Do we as believers have a truth and an obligation to, 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 to take people into truth, to, the, to lift these scales from people's eyes? That's something that the Lord can only do. And so today I want to, I kind of want to break this down of, of how do we know what the truth is and, 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 and how do we stand on it? How do we know when we're not on, on, on standing on truth? And you know, when I was in middle school, um, on Facebook, there's this article that people would write and it's, and it was, they would write about a bunch of stuff. You know, they would write about like, um, we landed on Mars with a telescope and now we can cook steak up there. Um, and it's just like these outlandish stuff or whatever, but it was called, anyone ever heard of the article, uh, the onion? No. Is, am I dated right now? It's the onion. But the onion was like funny. I guess, well, I guess it wasn't that funny. No one's heard of it. <laughs> but it was funny when I was in middle school <laughs> and everyone like thought this thing. But you would read this thing and be like, oh my gosh, that really happened? And then you would finish the article and it would say, written by the onion. <laughs> And you would just be duped. You would just literally be duped and believing this whole time. And then there was some truth. Oh, it's by the onion. So today, I kind of want us, I just want to remind us and encourage us what truth is, who truth is, and how we can stand on truth. Amen? So how do we know when you're not standing on your position? How to know when you're not standing on your position? How do you know, like, man, I'm, I'm sliding off this position of truth or I'm leaning some way up? Here's point number one is this. You don't regularly seek the truth. Well, that's pretty obvious. If you're not, if you're not regularly seeking truth, 
you're probably not standing on your position. You know, it's like this thing of like, you, you, you begin to almost expect other people to encounter God for you. In Exodus 19, it says this. And uh, verse 16, we'll throw it up on the screen. It says, on the morning of the third day, there was uh, thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18 says, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it uh, in, in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of killing, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. We see this picture of what's happening up the mountain. And the Israelites are literally being invited to this thing. And they're seeing all this thing, but they're taking their stand at the base of the mountain rather than going up. And in verse 19, uh, verse, uh, it says this. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound and the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Oh, lest we die. And then Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not uh, sin. And then here it is. Here's the response. Verse 21 says this. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. If you don't regularly seek truth, you start beginning to look to leaders, pastors, worship leaders, saying, hey, no, no, you speak to God, and you just tell me what he says, and then that'll be good enough for me. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you, the pastor will hear from God, and then he'll tell us about it, and that will be it. We'll be good. We, we don't need to go up to the mountain ourselves and seek truth for ourselves. Those worship leaders will do that. My life group leader will do that. Our dream team leads will do that. You know, Pastor Mark will do that. Pastor Lisa will do that. Pastor Aaron, you know, Pastor David, he'll do all of that. We don't need to seek truth for ourselves. They'll seek truth. Moses, you seek truth. You go talk to him. And we'll, whatever he says, you tell us. No, 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 no. When we don't seek truth regularly, we begin, we need that fresh manna. We, 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 we need to seek the Lord for ourselves. And what's crazy about this is the Israelites, they've seen amazing works of God. Who in this room has seen God work in amazing things? Come on, look at these, look at these hands. Testimony, testimony, testimony of God just moving. We've all seen God do amazing things. The Israelites saw amazing things. They saw, can you imagine a sea just being split into two and then just washing away a whole army and like just seeing all these, these plagues come on, on Egypt and the, and the Nile turning into blood, like all of these, they've seen amazing things. And yet they were satisfied with Moses going up there, speaking to God, tell me what he says, and then we'll, we'll listen to you. And they were hanging on to these experiences. They were hanging on to these things, which are great. But when you idolize experience, it, it begins to take away literally what God is trying to speak to us. If we're not careful, we'll begin to idolize our experiences with the Lord. What he's done in the past. What, he's, what, like, what, what, what has been great back there. The people of God didn't want to go up to the mountain of God. They rather cling onto their past experiences of God. And there's nothing wrong with remembering what God has done in your life. I hope you hear me. We should celebrate that. We have to praise that. We have to, we have to thank God for that. But relying on your past experiences to fan the flame of your heart will begin to deconstruct your faith to make it experience more powerful. You need fresh bread. Everyone say fresh bread. You need it. You know, it's like you got to remember what the Lord has done. You got to remember what he's brought you through. But you can't, your best days are right in front of you. He has not stopped. He's going to continue to work in your life. He's going to continue to speak in your life. He's going to continue to move in your life. You can have hope today because your best days aren't behind you. They're literally right in front of you. We need a church that's not clinging to our past experiences. We need a church that hopes again. 
We need a people, husbands and wives, to hope again for their families. We need people to hope again that our best days, even when the, even when the world is at its darkest, the church will shine its brightest because we carry this hope. We carry this hope and this thing. Come on. We have to get this fresh bread. We don't, we don't just need to praise God for the past, but we, we need to praise him for the future. We can't live off of other people's manna. We can't live off of other people's word. You know, it's so we, like the Israelites needed to understand they don't need to live off the word that Moses got from the Lord. They need to live off the word that God has for them. And if we're not careful, we'll continually come to church, we'll continually come to life group or whatever it may be, and we'll depend on someone else's word to get us through what God, in the season that God has us in. We need a word from God. Listen, getting a word from man is great, it's encouraging, I hope this message encouraged you, but if you go home and you hear from the Lord, that's better. And I'm telling you today, the Lord wants that for you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to speak to you. So you can't live off just what the worship leaders say or what the pastors say. We need to be in the word. We need to enjoy the presence of the Lord. We need to say, okay, you know what? It's not just the pastor's word. He's not gonna be the only one going up to the mountain to hear from the Lord so that he can tell me. I'm going to the mountain of the Lord. I'm gonna get a word for my family. I'm gonna get a word. Come on. The Lord wants to speak to you and use you. We have to be that. So if you don't regularly seek truth, you may not be standing on your position. Number two is this. You have a lot of things that represent God's presence. Golden calves, idols, these things that represent the presence of God. You're seeking assurance from things that represent God's presence. Idols actually do you know, kind of like produce stuff. You know, they're not just, they're, 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 they produce something. They even go so far to say that they produce some good stuff, right? Like comfort. If you, if you, if you worship an idol long enough, there's some comfortability in it. You kind of know it. There's some comfort in it. There's like, it, there might be like some money that comes or whatever it may be. But everything an idol produces isn't only a counterfeit and temporary, but it always leads to death. It always leads to death. Idols promise to fulfill things that only God can truly fulfill. And if we're not careful, we'll just have all these idols that represent the presence of God, but we don't actually cling to the presence of God. Israel was not only engaged in idolatry, but even worse, they turn from the voice of God to an image of God. And if we're not careful, we'll start neglecting the voice of God, the word of God, and try to put an image to God. And, and we'll begin to have something that represents his, 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 his presence. They committed the same sin almost as, as, as Adam and, and Eve. Rather than holding on tight to God's word, his truth, right? They determined that they knew better than God. They, they, they tried to stuff everything God is into a bull statue, which is impossible, which means they had to reduce God's character, his presence, and even his redemptive nature. Everything they did, they tried to stuff. They said, we know better than God. I know he's calling us up here, and we, we can have this, this intimacy with God, but I don't know, like Moses, you go up there and you tell us what he says. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll stay back here. If we're not careful, we're gonna, and then all of a sudden they're trying to build this stat. Okay, I, I think this is what God is. Let's, let's take our earrings off, build this thing. I think this is what God is. We'll do this, shape this. That's God for us. And if we're not careful, we'll have a lot of things that represent God's presence for us. Number three is this. You are in a constant state of uncertainty. You're constantly in this state of uncertainty. You're kind of disconnected because you lot, you have a lot of stuff that represents God's presence, but you've separated yourself from the peace and the presence and, 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 of, of the Lord. Exodus 32 says this. It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has come of him. And so Moses was where he was supposed to be, in the presence of God, 
right? He's where he's supposed to be. He's, he's receiving vision and instruction from God. There's no uncertainty. He's got a fresh word to hold on to. While he's up there, you can literally read it in the, in the previous chapters from 32. He's literally getting instructions of how to build the tent, of how God is basically revealing to him, hey, this is how we're going to worship. You're going to get these furnishings. You're going to, the, the priests are going to wear these things. He's literally giving detailed instructions. Why would he do that? Because he's trying to show Moses who he is. He's trying to reveal to Moses, hey, I am not just this mere beast. I'm not this something that you can reduce down to uh, as an animal or, or something that I am that I am. I am a royal. I am, I am God. Where he's trying to, every, every detail of the tent is kind of God revealing a characteristic of him. And so Moses is where he's supposed to do. He's listening to the voice of God. He's getting vision. Okay, okay, all right, we're gonna do this. We're gonna build it this way. Okay, we got this. He's getting vision. He's, he's, he's so certain because he's hearing from the word. He's, he's got a, a word from the Lord to hold on to. There's no uncertainty. But Israel is left in this atmosphere of uncertainty, right? They're kind of left in this atmosphere at the base of the mountain, just wondering, you know, what happened to Moses? Is he all good? I don't know. And then what happens is when you begin to operate and make decisions in uncertain atmospheres, when you're uncertain, when you're distant from the Lord, when you've separated yourself from the Lord, and now you're trying to make decisions, what happens is you start cultivating anxiety and fear and depression and sometimes boredom. And all this stuff is kind of happening, birthed out of this uncertain atmosphere. And so the Israelites are left into this, wondering what happened. And it's just, it's just crazy. And so if you are in a constant state of uncertainty, you might not be on your position. So how do we take up our position today, church? How do we take up our position? How do you stand on a position of truth, on God's word, of who, what truth is? How do we do that? Number one is this. We have to know God as he truly is. Someone says, no God. Oh, come on. Someone say, no God. Okay, come on. We have to know God as he truly is. You know, we have to know, like, uh, like the book of Exodus is literally a book of, of, of God trying to reveal himself to the Israelites. He's trying to show them who he is, what he's like, his, his, his kindness, his, what, who he is. So we have to truly know who he is. And when we, we read this, as we see, you know, the Israelites trying to build this idol and, and then they're going to have this festival and they're going to worship this idol and, and they're trying to do everything. They're trying to do, you know, um, um, in this book too, it's, uh, they, they're not actually trying to make this golden calf a different God. They're trying to understand what the God that brought them out of Egypt, who he is. And they're trying to, they're, they're trying to like image him. They're trying to create an image of him. And so, you know, and then they're, they're trying to worship it. So appropriate sacrifices, but the wrong perception of God isn't true worship. Their perception of God was wrong. Their sacrifices might have been appropriate, but their perception of who he was is completely wrong. Israel portrayed God as a mere beast. Moses was literally receiving these instructions that would, that would perceive God as who he truly was. And they're just, they're just, they're just not getting it. And then Jesus echoes this in the New Testament by saying, I am the way, the truth, the life. If you want to know what truth is, if you want to understand who truth is, truth is a person. Truth is Jesus. If you get anything from today is that truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. They're asking, how do I know what truth is? Jesus says, it is me. I am the truth, the life, and the way. We have to know God as he truly is. We can't just kind of like read our Bibles because that's what good Christians do. We can't just come in here and sing karaoke because that's what you do at church. Yes, sing. No, no, no. We need to come with a hunger and a desperation that says, I need to know who God truly is, Lord, because he wants to reveal it to you. 
He wants it to reveal it to you. He, he wants to uh, show you who he is, his likeness, his grace. He, he, he's so bound. He's so vast. For eternity, we are going to continue to be pondering and wondering the greatness and the magnificence of who God is. He wants to show us who he truly is. And so if you, if you, you have to know God as he truly is to take up this position of truth. Come on. Listen, this is my favorite place to speak because you guys just clap. And you're so nice. <laughs> you're so nice. I love you. you guys really are such family. Um, just so I just have to say that. It's, it's, I, I literally was on a run. This is, t- this is a total rabbit trail. <laughs> I was on a run the other day. And I just was so grateful for a church family. I just feel like this is a church family. Amen. It's just so good. I just love it so much. Uh, anyways, we'll, we'll get back into it. Number uh, three ways to take up your position. Number two is this. Go up to the mountain. Church, go up to the mountain. There's an invitation for you to, to be in the presence of the Lord. It's for everyone. You don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to try to make sense of it. There might be thundering and lightning and smoke and fire in your life, and it looks daunting to go up to the presence of the Lord, and it looks daunting to climb up that mountain. But if you would have the courage just to come just as you are, fire and all, and say, you know what? I'm coming just as me. I'm coming, I'm coming in hot. <laughs> I'm com- Lord, I'm coming in just dirty and messy. And, 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 but you know what? I just know the truth is, if I just get one moment in your presence, that could change everything. I'm not going to leave messy. I'm not going to leave mess up. But at one moment in the presence of the Lord can change everything. Church, you have to go up to the mountain. You have to get into the presence. Fear of going into the presence of the Lord is what created this atmosphere of uncertainty in the Israelite camp. This fear of not going up there is what led to this fear and this anxiousness and what happened to Moses. And the moment we don't correctly respond to the invitation to be near to the Father, we open ourselves up to fear. Uncertainty starts to form and anxiety comes. It's just not good. We need the presence of the Lord. We need you to take up your position on the mountain. We need you to go up there and be in his presence. And I don't know about you, and maybe some of the, the, the fathers in here can give an amen, but I, I just had a baby this year. I know. And it's seriously great. But I have never felt more attacked in my life the moment that she was born. And it's just... Uh, and it's just, I can actually, f- I, never in my life have I ever actually like, you know, felt the pursuit of like, of, of, of the enemy coming after me and my family. I feel it. And if I don't regularly go up to the presence of the Lord, I'm going to get crushed. I'm going to live in this this thing of anxiety. I'm going to live in this, this, this depression and this, this thing, even in hard seasons. It's this thing. The, going up to the presence of the Lord isn't just this nice, cushy thing. It's got to be this desperation. It's got to be like, God, if I don't have your presence, I don't know what I'm going to do. God, if I don't have your presence, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm going to skew from truth. And the truth is no, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Right? That's the truth. But the only way I can get that truth is if I go to the Father, if I go to the mountain, if I get that truth. And I know people are carrying real stuff in this room. You are carrying real life situations. And I'm not going to pretend I know. I'm not going to pretend my season is harder than anyone else's season. But I do know this, that no matter the circumstance, our response has to be the same. Our response has to be worship. Our response has to be his presence is enough. One encounter could change everything. We have to go up to the mountain. And number three, a way to take up your position is regularly repent. Regularly repent. Repenting regularly isn't always just saying, I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry. Oh, gosh, I did it again. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Repenting is coming to the Lord and saying, oh, God, I hate this thing. 
I hate it. I am so sorry. Lord, I know that, Lord, would you speak truth to me that I am delivered, I am free. Lord, would you give me wisdom on how to handle this thing? I don't want to be like this anymore. I'm turning from my sin and I'm running away from it. That's what repentance looks like. Repent, you have to do this regularly, day by day, choosing this thing of saying, okay, Lord, search my heart. You know, every morning, well, now that I have a baby, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> a routine. Uh, but I've kind of created the discipline of waking up early, and, and uh, I wake up before our baby, so it's great. But I will go into uh, our living room, and I'll, I'll have my scripture, or I'll have whatever. I might just have a cup of coffee sometimes. And I'll just try to get on my knees, just like this. And I read this scripture, Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my laying down. And it's just this heart of every morning saying, taking up my cross. And I, I try to do this every day if I can. I'm just saying, okay, God, I choose your way. And, we, and then we need to read this scripture more like this. Instead of you have searched my heart, we need to say, oh God, would you search my heart? And would you know me? Would you know when I sit down? And would you know when I rise? Would you discern every thought? Oh Lord, which is a scary prayer to pray because I know my thoughts. <laughs> I know my thoughts towards myself. And so, come on, sometimes... If you just think about the things that you say to yourself, you would never say that to another person. And sometimes what we say to ourselves is the harshest stuff. And so I want to go, Lord, would you search my thoughts? Would you give me grace? Would you know my ways? Would you search out my path? And what happens is he does it. He starts saying, oh, Blake, you know, uh, this person, you had this thought, man, that wasn't. And then what happens is like over time, you know, someone described this to me as our heart being kind of like a, a frozen chunk of uh, a ground beef. And the closer you, you hold it to a fire, it just starts to soften up. What happens when we regularly repent, that's what's happening. Your heart's beginning to soften. It's, it's all of a sudden you're, 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 you're real aligning your thoughts with the thoughts of the Lord because you're asking him, hey, God, search my thoughts. And he's like, okay, well, here's your thoughts. And all of a sudden your thoughts are, he's like, this thought isn't, isn't the best for you. This isn't my best for you. This isn't the way that I think. This is the truth. The truth is I have made you for such a time as this. I have given you grace. I have given you, you know, whatever it is. And all of a sudden we're getting downloaded of his truth and his grace. Oh Lord, would you know me? Would you know everything that I do? Would you know my heart behind my motives? Would you know, like when I do something, what is my motive behind it? Would you search that? And would you convict me of that? And what happens is the Holy Spirit, he convicts us, he convicts us so gently. He convicts us in the perfect way. He convicts us in the right way. And all of a sudden, we're in this posture of repenting. Repenting is powerful because it molds our hearts to look more like the heart of the Father. And I don't know about you, but I want to look like Jesus. I want to sound like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I, I want to serve the way that Jesus served. I want to love the way that Jesus loved. I want to have thoughts about myself the way that Jesus knew who he was. I want to, I want to speak to people the way that Jesus spoke to people. I want to care for people the way that Jesus cared for people. I want to interrupt my plans the way that Jesus had plans. And he interrupted him for the sake of people. I want to have a heart after God. I want to have a heart for people. And that only comes from God. That only comes from, Lord, search me and know me. Lord, search me and know me. Would you rip out everything that's of me? Less of me, God, and more of you. Less of me and more of you, Holy Spirit. Would you fill me up? Would you fill me up? Lord, I repent of my thoughts. Lord, I repent of what I've done. Oh, Lord, and we just get this image of the cross. I'm telling you, repentance is so powerful because it points us back to the cross. It points us back to Jesus. And he is the truth. He is the life. 
Repentance isn't just saying you're a bad Christian. You did wrong. No. Repentance is saying, oh God, I hate this. I don't want to, I want to be like you. Lord, mold me, sculpt me, search my heart. And we have to have the humility to let him do that, to hear his voice and to respond correctly. So this morning, I want to do that. You know, as the worship team was, you know, rehearsing and stuff, they were, uh, they did that song that we just sang, and it was Yeshua, Yeshua. Your kingdom come. They're speaking this truth, and I was sitting back there, and I just had a moment with the Lord of just like, wow, that's, that's what we need to end on. We need to have a moment of repentance. We need to go to the mountain together as a church. We need to seek his presence. We need him to speak to us today. I don't know what you came here with. I don't know what your marriage is going through, what your family is going through. If you have a prodigal son or daughter going through, I don't know your financial situation, but I do know this. We need to search the Lord. We need to seek the Lord today. He will begin to download who he is. He'll begin to impart wisdom to you. I believe there's gonna be some breakthrough today. We just need to storm that mountain today. That invitation is for you. His presence is for you. So come on, can we stand? We're going to storm the mountain together. And then we're going to just, if the Lord leads you, let him speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit convict you if that's, if that's, if he's speaking to you, let's repent. Let's repent for our thoughts. Let's repent for these things. But let's have this moment with the Lord. As the worship team continues just to sing the name of Jesus, we're singing truth. We're singing the name above every name. We're singing the truth of his name. So come on. We're going to lean in.